Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this pre-recorded lecture on 3D dental imaging and radiation safety. My name is Dr. Amanda Longo, and with this lecture, I hope to take you through a review of CBCT technologies and radiation safety in a dental practice. I feel uniquely poised to give this lecture because of my academic and my professional background. The work and research that I did throughout my PhD used microcomputed tomography. As one of the first to use micro-CT technologies, I had to answer several questions on radiation safety and exactly how this technology works. I brought this knowledge to my current role as the Chief Innovation Officer and Director of Strategy, a mouthful, I know, at the office of Dr. Peter Fritz, Periodontal Wellness and Implant Surgery. Our office is located in the heart of the Niagara region, in Font Hill, Ontario. It's here that our periodontists, Dr. Peter Fritz and Dr. Louisa Schultz, and their team of assistants see patients for all aspects of periodontal surgery. We also have a team of six dental hygienists who support patients with periodontal disease, ranging from grade A to C, stage one through four. You know, we see it all. Now in 2016, our CBCT found its lead-lined home in our clinic. On any given day, we acquire CBCT images of our patients for uses ranging from virtual treatment planning to pathology monitoring and periodontal disease. The acronym CBCT stands for Cone Beam Computed Tomography. All CT, or computed tomography, works using the same basic principles. The micro CT that I used in my PhD research and the CT scanners in the hospital are all the same. Cone beam is what's specific to dental imaging, which provides the most balanced combination of resolution and radiation exposure for the hardest tissues in the body, our teeth and the bones of our jaw. Because of its high resolution in three dimensions, CBCT has become the gold standard for dental imaging. Now, just because it's the gold standard does not mean that the CBCT has replaced conventional dental imaging. Rather, it's used to be um, as an adjunct to 2D x-rays. We use CBCT when it's appropriate as a diagnostic tool. For example, in patients with a really heavy gag reflex who can't bear a full mouth series of x-rays. We use the CBCT to avoid exploratory surgery. In the past, unless there was a gross crack or fissure in a tooth, a standard 2D PA may not have picked it up. Now, to be able to see a tooth that's causing a patient pain in 3D, we could move and manipulate the image to see it from all angles. When in the past, we, have had, we may have had to do an exploratory flap surgery on the area that was not responsive to scaling and root planing, now we can visualize with 3D imaging. This is so advantageous not only to the patient, but to the dental surgeon as well. Another great use of the CBCT is for virtual surgery and treatment planning. Let's take implants, for example. With a CBCT of the area in advance, Dr. Fritz and Dr. Schult know exactly the quality and the quantity of the bone they are working to place the implant in. They know the exact to the tenth of a millimeter distance to the mandibular nerve canal. Um, implants come in so many lengths and widths. With a CBCT image, we can choose the exact implant size and the angle that will place that implant before the patient is even in the chair. This information is so imperative, Dr. Fritz and Dr. Schult both say that they will never place an implant without a CBCT in advance again. So, we know the uses of CBCT. Now I want to take some time to explain the steps of CBCT imaging. So images are first acquired, then they're reconstructed by computer software, um, and finally they're analyzed and they're interpreted. So the acquisition of all CT scans follow the same basic principles because they're all made of the same basic parts, right? Each have an x-ray source, a detector, and a gantry that these aspects can rotate on. And just as in 2D, um, 2D x-rays, the object of interest is centered between the x-ray source and the detector. The x-ray source gives off a burst of energy which passes through this object, and depending on the density of the object, x-rays are absorbed or passed through to the detector where an image is made. 
I think they'd be kind of like those weird needle toys. Do you remember those things that when you used to push your hand on it, it would make an impression? X-rays are pushed out in a burst to the detector, but only those that make it through the object make an impression on the detector in the shape of the object that it's passed through. So um, the more dense the object is, the fewer the x-rays that can pass through it, and the less dense, the more x-rays can get through. So the image that's created is really just a gradient of densities. Now, like I said, this is the exact same technology as a 2D x-ray. So a single photon burst creates a single image, and here the resolution of the image is measured in pixels. We know about pixels well from our camera capabilities and the image resolution that we have on our computers when we're looking at a 2D image. But the main difference in 3D x-rays is that rather than a single photon burst, we have multiple bursts, which create an equal number of images. But of course, no, we're not taking a lot of pictures of the exact same spot, right? The x-ray source and the detector have to rotate around the object of interest on a gantry along the scan orbit. This time, the resolution of our image, because it's 3D, is measured now in voxels. So just the way we express area as units squared, we express volume as units cubed. The resolution of a 2D image and 3D image have to be expressed differently, so pixels versus voxels. So our thousands and thousands of images have been acquired, so now we reconstruct. So reconstruction involves using really sophisticated software algorithms that are applied to the raw data images to cre recreate these images along all three planes in a 3D volume. So we know this, we know we have the frontal or the coronal plane, right, which vertically derives the image or divides the image from anterior to posterior portions. We have the sagittal or the lateral plane, which splits the image from left to right. And then we have the transverse or the horizontal plane, which divides the image in superior and inferior sections. So let's take a look at how these three planes in a CBCT um, or in a CBCT acquired image, right? We have the frontal view, we have the sagittal view, a view from the side, and we have the transverse view, a view from the top down. When we're not really accustomed to seeing 2D images of a tooth from the three different planes, it can take a minute to orientate ourselves, but after some pra practice, visualizing uh, of a 2D image in 3D space starts to become second nature. So to review the difference, a 3D image is really the culmination of many, many 2D images reconstructed together. And the resolution of these 3D images is measured in voxels. Now, all CBCTs are different, but the resolution of the CBCT that we use at our practice um, can be either 75 or 150 microns. So 75 microns is equal to 0 0.075 millimeters. Now just take a second to wrap your head around that level of resolution for a second, right? A new image is acquired every 0 0.075 millimeters. Another way to think of it, for every millimeter that the x-ray source rotates around the object, right, rotates around a person's head, it takes 13 single images. During the reconstruction phase, these voxels are stacked on top of uh, one another, creating a series of blocks similar to a Rubik's Cube. When the reconstruction is all said and done, Something that takes the computer, which has remarkable power and a top tier graphics card, um, it only takes the computer about three to four minutes to create. And uh, sometimes I'm afraid to tell this, you know, back in my day story because I think it ages me. Um, but the processing power of our computers have come so far. When I was doing my research using the micro CT, really only a few years ago, 
I would set the computer up to reconstruct and leave it overnight. So what now takes minutes used to take hours, hours and hours. So what's rotating here is just one example of a 3D reconstruction from a CBCT image. So pretty powerful stuff. Now let's touch again on the acquisition of these two-dimensional images. The, these, these images that are stacked together to form the final 3D image. There are several settings that can be adjusted, all of which can improve the resolution of the image. But the resolution of the image is in a really delicate balance with the radiation dose to the patient. So the higher the resolution, the higher the resultant radiation dose. The first setting, voltage, is the measure of the electrical force that is applied to move the electrons from the negative to the positive pole. So to move the electrons from the source to the detector. The voltage is the speed of the electrons and is measured in kilovolts. The second, amperage, is a measure of the number of electrons moving through the conductor. The amperage is the strength of the photon, photon burst and it's measured in amps. The third, Resolution, something we've learned a lot about already. The resolution is the ability of an image to reveal its fine detail. So the greater the number of pixels per raw 2D image, the higher the spatial resolution in the resulting 3D image. The fourth, the exposure time, is the time set between individual bursts of x-rays uh, from the source. So increasing the exposure time improves the image quality to a point but this increases patient radiation exposure proportionately. The fifth is rotation step. Rotation step is the individual step through a 180 or a 360 degree arc. So that's how, how many degrees is the rotation interval around that object of interest. And finally, the field of view. So the size of the object of interest. Would we take an image of the whole head if we were only interested in a single tooth? No, of course not. By adjusting the field of view, we can focus our image and ultimately reduce the radiation exposure of the patient to only that very particular area. While each of these um, acquisition settings can be adjusted, Using the factory settings on our CBCT as a default often provide the best image quality at the lowest radiation dose. Therefore, we often don't change the voltage, the amperage, the exposure time, and the rotation step. The resolution can be adjusted, but we have the most control over the field of view that we opt to use. The smallest field of view is a 5 by 5 centimeter region of interest. This is used when we're imaging one or two adjacent teeth. Often we use a 5 by 5 centimeter field of view when conducting CBCT images for single implant planning or for the diagnosis of a single cracked tooth um, to determine if endodontic treatment is necessary or other scenarios where only one or two adjacent teeth are involved. We use this sized field of view most often, I would say, in our clinic. The next step up in the field of view is a five by eight centimeter region of interest. This is used when we're interested in imaging a full arch, so either the mandibular or the maxillary. We often use this field of view to plan for multiple either upper or lower implants um, when developing a surgical plan for hard tissue surgery, such as tori removal, um, if we're doing a sinus augmentation or a ridge augmentation. We also use this view to monitor and assess pathology, so such as the growth of a cyst um, or even in the diagnostics. And the largest field of view available to us um, is an 8 by 8 centimeter region of interest. Now, this is used when we're interested in imaging both arches at the same time. So again, we use this field of view to plan for multiple implants, um, to develop surgical plans for hard tissue periodontal surgery, and again, to assess pathology. Um, this field of view can also be used to replace a full mouse series of x-rays to diagnose and classify periodontal disease. So some patients just simply cannot get through a full mouse series. 
Um, because the acquisition, acquisition step of a CBCT is really only a few seconds, this option is often much more manageable for these patients. Now, we've talked a lot to this point about limiting our exposure to radiation. And there's a lot of ambiguity and confusion among the general public about radiation. Now, most of this confusion and fear is mainly due to the risks that are mentioned in the media and, you know, the dreaded internet. <laughs> Therefore, I can't stress enough how important it is for us as dental professionals to have a solid understanding of radiation and its pros and cons in diagnostics and treatment planning. So patients will be asking you the question, is this really necessary? Or how much radiation is this going to expose me to? They're going to ask you that daily and you need to be prepared with an answer. So radiation, it exists in many forms and not all of which are ionizing, right? Ionizing is the form that poses a risk to human health. So radiation is defined in part by its wavelength. So low frequency radiation like radio waves, um, thermal or microwaves, infrared, visible light, um, they're of too low penetrating power to produce any changes to the electron balance of atoms and molecules. So therefore too low power to impact human health. But higher um, frequency wavelengths such as ultraviolet, you know, x-ray that we're talking about now, gamma rays and cosmic rays, they all have a greater penetrating power. They're able to displace those electrons from their stable orbit um, and therefore to have the capacity to cause some cellular damage and really pose a risk to humans due to their ionizing potential. So exactly how does this work, right? How can radiation induced damage um, cause us harm? Here's another um, visual example of the scale of radiation and how it exists in many forms. So we have our non-ionizing things like our radio waves, microwaves, infrared, um, and our visible light, everything that we can see. Um, and then as we get higher, more frequent, frequent waves that have more penetrating power, so the waves that come from the sun in our UV light, our X-rays and our gamma rays and cosmic rays, those are all ionizing, and so those are the ones that can cause us harm. Uh, so how does this radiation induce damage and cause us harm? Remember that it's all about the strength or the intensity of that wavelength. So non-ionizing radiation is of low-powered wavelength. They're softer waves that when they bump into the electrons that are, you know, buzzing around all the time, um, that are buzzing around the nucleus of a stable atom, they don't do anything. They're not strong enough to sort of knock into that electron and knock it off its stable orbit. But as we move along that continuum of wavelengths and they get tighter and tighter and, and uh, the frequency gets higher and higher, therefore they get more and more powerful, they pass through a threshold. And a threshold whereby if that high energy wavelength bumps into an electron that's just minding its own business, you know, circling around the nucleus of an atom, wham, it gets knocked off. So this high frequency wavelength of radiation has turned this stable atom into an ion, right? Hence the name ionizing radiation. So by knocking the electron out of axis, when we have a free or unpaired electron floating in space, this is when we can run into trouble. Because an unpaired electron is a very dangerous thing. And depending on what it bumps into, it could wreak havoc. So particular, particularly if it bumps into a strand of our DNA and causes some cancer-inducing changes. So with this understanding of exactly how radiation can induce cellular changes and impact our health, it becomes easier to estimate a person's risk. Our patients are often concerned with their risk to radiation damage, uh, damage induced cancers and you know, rightfully so. Um, there are several factors that influence the likelihood of radiation damage and those include um, total absorbed dose. So this depends on the energy or the wavelength of the radiation, right? Are we talking UV light or are we talking gamma rays? 
Um, and then also the type of matter with which it interacts. So is it aimed at fast reproducing cells like the bone marrow or blood cells or immature reproductive cells? Um, these, these fast reproducing cells are what we call um, radiosensitive. Or is it interacting with low radiosensitive cell types, those that are more resistant to changes? So things like muscle cells, nerve cells, mature bone, the salivary gland um, is a very low radiosensitive sensitive cell type. Um, another thing that influences or estimates our risk is the amount of tissue irradiated. So how big of a field of view are we exposing to radiation? Are we choosing that 8 by 8 centimeter field or the smaller 5 by 5? Also our age. So younger individuals with immature developing tissues are always at a greater risk for radiation damage. Um, and the last is our dose rate. So radiation damage is additive. A greater dose applied over a shorter period of time may actually increase the likelihood of damage. And the next question, you know, how do we know this? Now, obviously, no research ethics board in the world is going to allow anyone to do a study to show, you know, cause and effect of radiation and cancer occurrence. Hey, you know, just stand here for a second while I blast you with radiation and uh, we'll come back in five years to see if your cancer incidence is higher than the control, you know, that I blasted with rainbows and butterflies. Obviously, we can't ask that question ethically. So all of our understanding is based on epidemiological data sets from survivors of atomic bombs or from astronauts who have floated in space um, near those cosmic rays or from radiation therapy patients. And from these big epidemiological studies, it's suggested that there is a linear response of radiation with the development of cancer. So simply put, at no minimal threshold, as your at no minimal threshold, as your radiation dose increases, so too does your probability of developing cancer. This is called a linear non-threshold model for estimating risk. It assumes that everyone experiences a background incidence of, you know, developing a spontaneous cancer. This is paired with our background radiation exposure. And it's true, just simply living on planet Earth exposes us to at least some background radiation, something that we simply can't avoid. We see from this graph that as we move up the radiation dose, we increase our probability of causing DNA and cellular damage proportionately. So, Therefore, um, when prescribing any dose at all of radiation for medical or for dental imaging, we must always abide by the ALERA principle, as low as reasonably achievable. We must always ask ourselves, how can we get the information we need with as little a dose as reasonably achievable? At present, Canadian dose limits um, which are set out by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission for Radiation Workers. Um, so that includes all of you listening who are or soon will be HARP certified, those that are qualified to take an x-ray. So that um, radiation um, dose limit is 50 millisieverts per year. Now for the general public, so those who are not trained in radiation safety at all, that limit is 1 millisievert per year. Now, to keep your mind at ease, a study of radiology staff over a three-year period showed that these radiation workers received doses that were no greater than 1.5 millisieverts per year. And remember when I mentioned those sources of background radiation that we're all exposed to? That background radiation makes up for about 50% of that 1 millisievert per year limit, and the other 50% 50, 50 is medical imaging. Now, something worth noting, there's no defined limit to the amount of radiation a patient is able to experience, so no upper limit. This is because it's assumed that all ionizing radiation by a medical source is done to directly benefit the patient and that the ALERA principle is strictly followed. I found that this visual representation to be really useful when I'm explaining common sources of radiation and how they compare with each other. This of course simplifies a highly complex topic, but nonetheless, it can be a good comparative teaching tool. 
So here we can see that a dental CBCT falls within the ionizing radiation spectrum, just above a film x-ray and a digital x-ray, but still below a cross-Canada flight and many other methods of medical imaging like a mammogram or a PET scan. As we move further along the spectrum, we can see the impact of smoking one and a half packs of cigarettes per day, and also where the, that safe upper limit for radiation safety workers exists. Now, of course, this infographic is not to scale. I want to stress that because we can even see an astronaut's yearly dose followed closely by radiation sickness and fatality at doses experienced after tragedies like atomic bombs or radiation plant explosions. Something people always pick up on when I show them this infographic is the banana. <laughs> So yes, uh, eating a banana has a very, very small amount of ionizing radiation, right? Who would have thought? So back to the Alera principle. How can we be sure that we're always abiding by this principle? The first way is to only prescribe radiographs when they're absolutely necessary for diagnostic purposes. Now for periodontal diagnosis, diagnosis and classification, we prescribe a full mouth series of x-rays once every five years. Um, the second way is to share these radiographs that you take with other offices or you know, have patients bring to their appointment with them their most recent records. The third way is to adjust the acquisition settings, so to provide the lowest radiation dose possible. And remember, the most simple setting to adjust is the size of that region of interest. So taking an image of only what's truly necessary. And the fourth way to do this is to avoid having to take any retake images. So to get it right on that first try. Now we've covered image acquisition and we've covered reconstruction and in that talking a lot about radiation safety. But now if we move on to that final step that's involved in CBCT imaging, which is analysis and interpretation. So as you saw in image, er, images earlier, a great benefit to CBCT imaging is the ability to manipulate, to maneuver, and to reorientate the 3D image in space. This, is, this drastically improves the clinician's ability to diagnose and to treatment plan. So let me show you with a few interesting cases um, that have come through our clinic. Now, in this first one, um, a patient has long described a pain and sensitivity to the 4-6. So they brought with them to their appointment a pan and PAs that had been taken prior. Um, and you can see from the pan that this patient has had ortho. Right? They have healthy bone levels, and from here we don't see any obvious pathology. So what is going on at the 4-6? If we take a closer look at the PAs, there is no overtly obvious t um, issue here for what could be causing that pain and that sensitivity. So we prescribed a CBCT. On that, CB on that 3D image, we can see that the 4-6 that they had been been describing as sensitive to hot and cold is not fully embedded in bone. Likely, from the orthodontic work, this tooth has probably been pulled outside of the cortex of the mandible and one root is not protected. Now unfortunately, there's not much that can be done for this patient, um, but at least now we have an answer for their discomfort. Here um, in another example, uh, this uh, the CBCT in our periodontal clinic is used most often for planning for implant placement. So here we can see in multiple views exactly where an implant will be placed and the quality of the bone in which it will be placed. So this view helps our clinicians to decide in advance if bone grafting is going to be necessary for our patients. We can also look at all of the 2D slices of that 3D image, and we can measure um, the exact distance to the sinus and the exact distance between the neighboring teeth. So this allows us to determine the length and the width of the implant to be placed prior to our patient even being in the operatory. Software now um, even allows us to take implant planning one step further and perform this virtual surgery.
Now, when patients are diagnosed with periodontal disease, uh, we perform non-surgical periodontal therapy, so scaling and root planing um, by our dental hygienists. And in over 90% of the cases, we see drastic improvements in periodontal indicators, like bleeding on probing, like pocket depth, and clinical attachment. However, there are instances when a tooth just doesn't respond to the traditional method and we need to perform periodontal flap surgery. So before we do that, we want to have a visual, of course. So this is one example of a tooth that didn't respond to non-surgical sanative therapy. And we can even detect calculus on the root of this tooth. So with flap surgery, Dr. Fritz or Dr. Schultz, they're able to surgically pull away the gum tissue and manually remove this stubborn calculus and biofilm that's cause, causing all of that inflammation and that bone resorption that we can see there. And I mentioned earlier the group of patients who simply cannot complete a full mouth series of x-rays for the life of them. So this is an example of a patient who needed diagnostic imaging but couldn't stand to complete a 2D series. So in this 3D image, we can see how drastic the amount of bone loss is around so many of their teeth. Now, um, another neat example of hard tissue surgery is the removal of large tori. So here we can see a huge bony growth on the palate. And this maxillary tori was causing the patient uh, difficulty speaking and eating and just had to go. So with 3D imaging, we're able to see the size and the density of this bony growth, which gives Dr. Fritz and his team of assistants a, a perfect visual. When we can see perfectly the hard tissues, um, the bone, we can see perfectly the hard tissues, right? The bone and the teeth. Um, but with some adjustments of the software, we're even able to look at some soft tissue pathologies. So in this example, we can see a neurofibroma. So with the software, we're able to acquire the size of this fibroma, we're able to measure it. And over time, we can reassess the area to watch for ch changes in shape and changes in size, and also changes in density. So to conclude, uh, CBCT really is the new gold standard for dental imaging because of its ability to resolve in great detail those 3D images that we can then move and manipulate. The radiation dose that's provided by a dental CBCT is relatively low and be can be considered safe. However, all exposure to radiation should be prescribed with careful consideration of the pros and cons. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for watching this rapid review on CBCT and dental imaging. I know that our time is precious, and uh, so I really appreciate you spending for half an hour um, expanding your mind with me, learning something new. And of course, if there are any questions at all, please don't hesitate to write them in the comments here um, or to visit our website, uh, drpeterfritz.com. Uh, where you can read about our blogs and, and more information on, on 3D imaging. Now, it's been an absolute pleasure, so thank you very much.